You're listening to the Sensuality Project Podcast, where the messiness of real life gets sexy, hosted by Stacey Herrera. This podcast is intended for mature audiences only. Episodes contain profane language and topics of a sexual nature that may not be suitable for children. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to another episode of the Sensuality Project Podcast. I am your host, Stacey Herrera. I'm so happy to be here. I've been absent. You noticed. I know you did because I know that you're listening to every episode and you can't wait for the next one to drop. I know that's the truth. I've been a little bit absent. I have been busy doing a lot of other things. I have some other balls in the air, which are going really well. I'm really excited about, but I've also been procrastinating. (laughs) It's interesting how we tend to procrastination is probably not the right word. I've had some resistance. You know, we only resist the things that that threaten to change us on a cellular level. And we resist the things that we're really good at. I really love this podcast. I really love connecting and having these juicy, deep, expansive conversations with people from all walks of life. I am enjoying this so much. So I am recommitting to making sure that I deliver episodes on a timely basis. And today is... Today is a great, a great lead in to my new recommitment. I am chatting with Carmen Renee of Eat the Cake 2 today. Um, You may follow her on Instagram. She's got a ginormous following, like over 65,000 followers. Her work is around um, body acceptance. She is a lymphedema warrior. She is gorgeous. She's beautiful. And she she has so many beautiful body positive images. And she's a model. And she's just, she's real. Like, I think that even more than her beauty, she's like super real. Like, she talks about her own um, challenges and her own path to accepting herself in the space that she's in. And so she's so encouraging because she shares herself 100% with without any fluff. Like she talks about the good stuff, but she also talks about the challenges. And I think that she she's just super relatable. So I totally, I think everyone, everyone should follow her page. I love her so much. And this was actually our first time talking and it felt really natural. It was really comfortable. I really enjoyed her so much. If you don't follow her on Instagram, do it now. Um, at Eat the Cake too, And also she's got a new talk show on LA Talk Radio called The Plus Size Divas. It airs every Tuesday at 7 p.m. And she's just amazing. She's amazing. So I'm going to stop talking so that you can enjoy this juicy conversation. We talk about so many things. We talk about body positivity, of course. But we also talk about squirting and we talk about, you know, sexual pleasure for women. We talk about the porn diet. Like we talk, we, we touch on so many things. It's just so, so good. You're going to enjoy. Here you go. Okay, so how do you feel about the squirting epidemic? Like, I'm so over people talking about squirting. How do you feel about that? (laughs) I I mean, I feel like if you do, you do. And if you don't, you don't. And it really shouldn't matter. I don't know when it became such a thing. Right. Um, And the reality of it is, let's be honest, it's really messy. Okay. Right. Like, if you don't, you're really just saving yourself an extra load of laundry at the end of the day. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. I agree. You know, it's it's interesting to me because I've had, like, I had someone, I was at a funeral last week, and... Oh my gosh, a funeral and someone talked to you about squirting? You know, after, you know, we're at the repast and people are drinking, and, um, and, and I'm like, everywhere I go, I talk about sex, so... Um, I was having a conversation incidentally with a friend of mine who's blind. So we were actually having a conversation about like all of the sensory stuff that you can experience when there is no sight. And so someone else walked into the conversation and she's like, you know, she's like, "Um, I'm in a new relationship and it's great. And with him, I'm able to squirt. How can I make myself do that? Mm. And I was like, well, you probably can't maneuver your hand in a way right. <laughs> to let to reach where you need to go. Yeah. You know, but I was like, there are toys for that. But I was like, but it's okay if you don't. I know. I don't honestly, I mean, I have before, um, and it it's it's fine, but it's not like, oh, I feel like I have to do that in order to reach like, you know, optimal pleasure. It's not something that's like 
a must for me. You know, if, if I don't, then I don't. And I honestly, to be very honest, I would rather not (laughs) because it's just too much of a mess for me. I'm not, I'm just not that person. Yes. Well, I am with you. And I also think that I think that we like because squirting now is like the new the new orgasm. Right. So I think that the reason the the focus on it is becoming annoying to me is because it's really now the the next thing to chase the next performance chaser. Right. No, I agree with you. It's not it's not a you know, end all be all. And I don't want people ever to feel like just because they can't, or maybe they haven't that, you know, they're doing something wrong. Or if you're with a partner who can't make you do that, I don't want them to feel insecure that they're not pleasuring you. I agree. And and I think that pleasure needs to be the focus and right. not not the, you know, even even with orgasms, I have had extremely pleasurable sex that that no orgasm occurred. I'm with you. And for me, you know, I am it's really hard for me to orgasm with penetration, but it's always very pleasurable. You know, I've been with my partner for um, almost eight years and <clears throat> it's it's just one of those things like I really enjoy sex and it's it's always pleasurable when it's done right. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to orgasm every time from penetration. I agree. And penetration is just one kind. Incidentally, look now at that same funeral. Like, <laughs> Oh, my God. I most of these funerals with you. <laughs> at, at that same funeral, I was having a conversation with someone else and he was talking about someone he had slept with in the past. And he was saying, you know, that she wasn't that she had some physical health issues that prevented certain kinds of sex. Um, And I was like, well, penetration is just one kind of sex. Like there's so many other fucking things you could be doing that don't, that don't require her to do anything acrobatic that could put her physically, you know, in a physically uncomfortable position. But like having that conversation with a man who is close to 50 I thought, wow, how even when, even though men grow up on the porn diet, most men grow up on the porn diet, right? But even with that, you could get to be 50 and still not really know that penetration isn't the only thing you could do. I know, I know. And that's, I mean, but growing up on the porn diet, like really, I think is, has its dangers as well, because it just sets an unrealistic idea for people about what sex should be, what it, you know, what it looks like, what it sounds like. And that's just not everybody's reality. It really isn't. So it really it's not isn't. surprising to me. And, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm definitely not a porn expert, but they don't go a lot of like the sensual, the sensual aspect of it is definitely not there. So it's not surprising to me that maybe he's lacking in a few areas. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. look, I won't give too many details. He, he, I'll just say he is lacking in, in a few areas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Well, then he just shouldn't even be complaining. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, yeah, I th- there's there is a, there's so much like um, I'm not a porn expert either. I haven't uh, I actually haven't seen very much porn. It just does nothing for me. I'm more of a I'm so bookish that I'm more aroused by reading about sex than I am at looking at sex. Yeah, I get that. I'm more of a like I just want the foreplay and and then that's it if yeah. I watch porn. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I, I wish that they did more of that. You know, and then I also think that it's it's very important for porn watchers to get that in order for them to get to make the sex on porn look in a way that you could see it. Because if you just saw people having sex, if you and with no like with a one camera situation, right, if you just w- happened upon someone having sex, you really wouldn't see much. Right. So like in order for them to to have it visually appealing in a way for you to really be able to see such things, it has to be unrealistic. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, even if you see like unless unless it's horses fucking, you know what I mean? Otherwise, you really in even in nature, you really don't see very much from looking at someone having sex. Like it's rare for you to actually see penetration even happening because legs and thighs and all kinds of, you know, fleshes and is it obscure. 
exactly. skews your view. So in porn, you get to see everything. So that just speaks to how unrealistic it is because they have to, it, no one would buy it if you couldn't see anything. Exactly. Right. That's true. That's really true. I never thought about that. Yeah. It's, uh, look, clearly I've probably thought about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> I like it. So what do you think, um, what's the most difficult, because you said you've been in a relationship for eight years, which congratulations, that's a long ass time. Thank you. <laughs> it is. In, in relationship years, that's a long ass, especially today. Yeah. Like for you to be a young person in a relationship for that long, that is, that is definitely um, a big deal. Well, thank you. It's, um, it's always a work in progress. <laughs> So, so what's the most difficult self-focused obstacle that you've ever had to overcome in, in this relationship or any past relationships, like your own shit? Like what, what's the hardest thing that of your own that you had to get over in order for a relationship to thrive? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think hands down, it would be my own insecurities. You know, being in this relationship has early on really, really forced me to, um, look at my own insecurities, ones that I didn't even know that I had, and then try to figure out how I'm going to get over those. So just recently, I would say in the last two and a half to three years, I really just came into a different space of a really positive space and, um, like a a non-judgmental space. Mm -hmm. And I think I came to that space a lot a lot of that has to do with being in my relationship. So for me, that space came with stopping comparing myself to other women, you know, judging other women, um, just constantly feeling like I'm in competition. Mm-hmm. I, th- I feel like society forces that upon us. So I got to that point because, you know, I'm with uh, somebody who's very, um, just in love with the female form, period. You know, he appreciates the female body and a woman's sensuality and sexuality. And that was really new to me to be with somebody who's very open about that. And, you know, is the least judgmental person you'll ever meet. And I would, you know, he would say certain things and I'd be like, how could you say that? Like about another woman or no, like she's doing too much. She's wearing, you know what I mean? I'd be judging her. And he really was like, I think you, I think you have some insecurities, you know, about yourself that you could probably look into. I mean, I don't think we came to that exact point, you know, specifically, Mm -hmm. but, um, and he was right. And, and, you know, once I started to identify that within myself, it just took me to a different place, not just in a relationship, but for me, which is how I got to where I'm at on Instagram with my brand, eat the cake too you know, and being very open with my body. Once I kind of put those insecurities, I tried to deal with them and I stopped comparing myself. Then I just fell in love with my body so much more. And as you can imagine, that's extremely beneficial to a relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sex. I think once you know yourself sexually and you allow yourself to have the freedom of just, you know, pleasure and enjoying your body and letting your partner enjoy your body, um, you feel really different. And I, I think that's what I've been able to learn most. And that's what I've been able to share through, um, eat the cake too. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that the most important part of, well, first of all, loving your own body allows you to stay in the room because when I say that, I mean like your, like when we are thinking about our own self-consciousness, like, oh my God, he's like probably thinking my thighs are so big or this roll on my back is probably whatever. You know, like the minute you start doing that, you sever the connection and it, pleasure is gone. Yes, totally. Like it just can't exist in the space of that. So like being able to even because there are people that that can't even imagine like actually loving their body. And that's okay If you can just get to the place of accepting like this is how my body is today. Yes. Yeah. You know, even if that is like I would love it if it were five pounds lighter. But today this is what I have to work with. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Like that is a huge um, and it's so light. It makes you feel so light. It's 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 expensive to be insecure. (laughs) It 
it's expensive. I mean, it costs you emotionally, but yeah. it wears the hell out of your wallet. I know. You're very right about that. It's, And that's, I mean, I think what you just said is so important. That's what I really try to preach every single day is this is your body today. You, you might have goals for it, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is your body. If you don't love your body today, you're not going to love it, you know, five pounds from now. Yep. That's just how I feel. I mean, and I think that's from experience. I've been, you know, heavier and lighter. And the reality of it is, is that I just have to wake up every morning and look myself in the mirror and tell myself I'm the shit and that my body, I'm thankful for it. And, you know, it does really great things for me. And um, it sure gives me a lot of pleasure. So I cannot complain. Absolutely. I am with you 100%. I feel exactly the same way. I mean, I've I've actually never had a negative body image like and I've I'm I've always been a big girl. Like I have no skinny memories, but I've never like my internal dialogue has never been negative, so I didn't know for a long time that that was even a thing. That's really amazing. And honestly, that's I I feel so happy for you. <laughs> you know, that now I have other shit. That just wasn't the thing. Like, <laughs> got other shit that I had to work through. That thing wasn't the particular thing. In fact, I didn't know it was a thing until I was in my 20s and I went, to, I joined Weight Watchers because one of my girlfriends had become, she had gotten diagnosed with diabetes and I joined in support of her. And when we were in the meetings and the women started talking, I, I was, I was baffled. I did not even know that that's what happened in people's heads. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, like I couldn't imagine like living with that voice. Um, Now, you know, people, we are all on the some continuum in terms of our insecurities of yes. not enoughness or too muchness. I'm on the too much side. So so I never am worried about not being good enough. I'm always worried about someone thinking I'm too much because that was the narrative that I was told as a child. You talk too much. You think you know everything, that kind of thing. So, um, So I'm always worried about shrinking, not hiding. Hmm. So I think that that had a lot to do with why my inner voice didn't um, talk negatively to me. And I'm really unresponsive to to negative um, input, not not just from me, but from anyone. So like that's a fast way to get me to not listen to you anymore. So my inner dialogue is much more um, manipulative. She'll say shit like, you know, you um, you should go on and have that. You should eat whatever you like because you've worked hard for it and you deserve it. And I'm like, yes, I do. Like. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's I, like you said, I, everyone has their thing, but that's body image is so huge right now. A negative body image. Yes, so it is. I'm really happy for you that you, that you, you know, have that just confidence and you've always had that. I mean, that's really amazing. I, I, my mom, I was in Weight Watchers in junior high. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I mean? I just, my earliest memories have always been food related in a negative way. You know, don't eat this. You shouldn't have that. Um, it And always wait, always wait. Really. Yes. Yes. Now, you know, I had, I, I did have a lot of input from other people telling me something was wrong with my body. So I had a hard time reconciling how I felt with what I heard. Mm. Because yeah. because I didn't feel like that. But then, you know, having people say you you're, you would be really cute. You have such a cute face. Like yeah. <laughs> that kind of shit, you know, oh, and yeah. like and then I also had like my mom. My mom was very shapely, you know, as a younger woman. And my older sister also like Coke bottle, you know, and I didn't look like that. And my younger sister is like super petite. So I was the I came here like nearly 10 pounds. And I think that the, one of the things that was probably really helped to shape that inside of me was that even though my mother, my mother had no experience living in a fat body. She, you know, so having a fat child was not something she could relate to, but she never made me feel fat. And, you know, and she, she made a lot of our clothes. So she, that meant her cutting patterns bigger because I was bigger and, yeah. and she was just accommodating, but she never made me feel like something was wrong with me. And I think that that really helped a lot. And I, I mean, I was always um, very sure of myself, but I didn't get like the negative self-talk at home. It didn't happen until, you know, kids are fucking cruel. 
Yes, they are. So yep. that's where the negative, you know, talk came from was like kids saying shit. And it just made me mean, honestly. I just got mean. Like instead of crying, I just would like talk major shit. Like I remember this specific incident in middle school with this guy. He was like one of the most popular kids and he loved to tell fat jokes. And one day I was just like, you probably got a fat mama. <laughs> and one and he was he he got on the school bus by himself like nobody else was at his stop and this one particular day we were like dropping off in the afternoon and pulled up at his stop and his mother was in the car waiting for him and she was fat oh my gosh and he looked at me and i i just smiled i didn't even say anything because right. and at the time like i didn't realize you know i'm in 8th grade right so i didn't realize at the time that the reason that people like that, the reason that people target certain things is because they have a personal relationship with the thing that they're teasing. But I didn't know that at the time. So really, it was just me trying to jab him because like, I'd never seen his mother before. You know, it's like, you probably have a fat mama. I didn't know it was true. Like, <laughs> I didn't know it was true. Anyways, he never he never teased me again after that. Wow. I mean, again, like I really envy your courage when you were younger, just to stand up for yourself, you know, and have it. I mean, I know, yeah, being mean obviously isn't the best no, way. No, it isn't. It, yeah. But I don't know. I just, you know, bullying is such a huge part of kids' lives. I mean, everyone's lives. I get bullied on Instagram every day, but you know what I mean? It just, I've come to the point where it doesn't bother me at all. But I know for kids, it's just so hurtful. It is. It is. And, you know, and how we receive things like, you know, we all because my that was just my defense mechanism. I mean, for some people's defense mechanism is crying and that's OK. You know, yeah. I just happen to I as soon as someone tries to hurt me, my instinct is to gut them. You know, like, <laughs> like, like I'm fucking taking you down. But like, I I had to then work through that because it was like this layer of thick skin that I developed that really blocked intimacy for most of my life. Really? And yes. Like, oh my goodness. Yes. Like I really, you know, you don't know it at the time you, you know, but when you're operating from the space of defending yourself, expecting like you all, your fist is always balled up just in case. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that yeah. was me emotionally. And so it, it's been a lot of work of me unraveling that. Because it it started off me just trying to protect myself from people saying shit that I didn't that didn't feel true to me. Right. So, yeah, like it, it didn't stop me from uh, having to work through that shit. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But, you know, humans are amazing and ridiculous simultaneously sometimes. <laughs> yes, very much so. You know, so so um, since like Instagram is like um, that's what that's like your biggest fan base. Do yeah. you do you find that because I was just listening to a, a radio program a couple of days ago and um, it was an actress and I can't think of her name right now, but she was saying how, you know, social media, it really does enhance insecurity and which I think is true. Like if you feel some kind of way about yourself, you can find so, there's so much evidence. And that wasn't a thing when I was younger. You know, I mean, I grew up in the 80s, so you know, our biggest comparison, if there was any, was like Teen Beat or Tiger Beat magazine. You know what I mean? It wasn't, yeah. there was no constant, even if even if there was someone at school that you thought w looked better than you or something, you didn't have to, there was, you didn't have to go home and see that person. But like yeah. now, like you leave school and then you go home and now it's on your phone. You're carrying, you know, the ability to access things to make you, to confirm what you feel about yourself all day long. Yeah, I have, um... You know, I have mixed feelings on on that. For me, honestly, I I think social media, yes, positives and negatives. For me, though, what social media has done is given a platform to people, body shapes, colors, you know, genders that up until this point didn't have a platform. So for me, I actually. I started finding women that I was like, oh my gosh, my body, you know, looks similar to this and they're, you know, in swimsuits, they're in laundry, they're modeling. It made, it actually made me feel a lot better. Whereas when I was growing up, I never saw that, you yes, know, never saw anyone who looked like me on TV, you know, in a, in a relationship. Um, I, I just didn't see, it. I didn't see it in the magazines and that was really 
that was really hard for me growing up, especially when it came to being in a, you know, any type of relationship, just because I never saw it. You know, I didn't even think it existed for fat people to be in, you know, successful, sexy relationships with, you know, really great sex. Mm -hmm. I would have never known that existed. So for me, I, yes, of course, if you're really having insecurity issues, you can go on social media and find ways that are just going to drag you down even further. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if you're in a, in a space where you're feeling negative about your body, you can also go on social media and find really inspiring women whose bodies don't look like the bodies that we still see in mainstream media. And to me, that's been really inspiring. And, you know, that's what I've wanted to be. You know, I have lymphedema, which is very uncommon. And I am a big girl. So I have a couple things, you know, that aren't necessarily um, what society would deem as part of their standard of beauty. But I'm using it as I'm hoping as a way to inspire women who are feeling insecure about their bodies instead of being another Instagram model who's photoshopped and filtered. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I tend to lean towards the side of you can find inspiration instead of finding more insecurities. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly and to people that are feeling like, if if when they're if they're scrolling and and feeling like they're less than, then they should be unsubscribing. Like <laughs> unfollow, yeah. unfollow. Like if something when you look at something or someone's page and it makes you feel something that you don't want to feel, unfollow that shit. I'll like follow them. Oh, un- I'm, uh, yeah, unfollow. I'm, like I, you know, do that with your friends if you have to. Like <laughs> you know, you don't. Have, you can know them or not know them. But if if something makes you feel in a way that you don't desire to feel, you should unfollow. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And there's, there's just so many amazing people on social media that, that you can follow and let that be your, exactly. let that be your little bubble of social media that makes you feel good and better about yourself and leave everything else because most likely it's not real. You know what I mean? Everybody, nobody is. And I guess this is the thing that I found most since I've been on this journey of mine, you know, even those Instagram models don't, love their bodies every day. Right. Friends who look like, I mean, I grew up in a small town in Oregon, blonde hair girls, thin, you know, tall, whatever the case may be. And I go back and visit and they still don't love themselves. They don't love their bodies. And they're, you know, envious that I am in such a positive space and they want to know how, how they can get there. Mm -hmm. Like that speaks volumes to our society and, and just how we're constantly ripping each other down. And we're really taught that we're never enough, no matter if you look like the Victoria's Secret model or not. So on the same boat with you, um, you know, we just look different and people always assume that, you know, just because she, he or she looks a certain way that they have no problems. And that's just not the case. At all. And I, I do think that that's what people think. You know, when they, you know, or it's like people think that about people with certain body type. People think that about people that have money. Like, yep. um, you know, if I had like, oh, what do you mean? So and so committed suicide because they were depressed. They had money. That doesn't mean anything. I that know. doesn't mean anything. And, you know, whatever beautiful is, which, you know, is completely subjective. But, yes. you know, whatever beautiful is, all people that are beautiful struggle too. like I, I've never met someone that didn't struggle with something. No, me neither. And I wouldn't want to kick it with that person anyway. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to hang out with you. Like, like, what are we going to talk about? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I mean, I think our problem really lies in, uh, I guess this was kind of how I also deal with the negativity on social media and the bullying and the, you know, trolling is I just always say, I feel bad for that person because for whatever reason, they're in a, such a negative space that they have to go on and say something cruel about my body in order to feel better about theirs. And I just feel sad for them. And I wish that, you know, we could all just understand that we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. We all have our issues and let's just help each other instead of just continuing, continuously tearing each other down. I, I agree. You know, it's interesting because after the Beyonce, um, 
Coachella thing la- yeah. um, last weekend or whenever. Like some, I was on Twitter and like some of the comments, I was just like, do you have like nothing to fucking do? No, they don't. You know what I mean? Like you don't have anything to do, but, but I mean, even like when you go on, you can, cause it doesn't like any, any t- social media, you can find those people, but it's like, you don't have anything to do, but write negative comments about somebody. No. Like it never even occurs to me. Even if I look at a picture and I have an adverse thought, I never feel like I need to comment and tell you what I thought about it. No, I, ne- I'm with you. I have never even had that urge to comment something negative about somebody's appearance or body. I just like, if you don't, and that's why I say on my, I, I sometimes I comment back to trolls. I'll be like, if this is not what you like seeing, then don't look at it. You know what I mean? Go to someone else's page. Oh, well you just popped up on my timeline. And then keep scrolling. It's not that hard. You know right, what I mean? right. I agree. And you know, and then like, I think I'm, I'm, I want to celebrate you though. I think that it's so important to see different body types and, and like you, I didn't have any images. I didn't even have the images at my own house, you know, like nobody looked like me. And again, like, thankfully my, my mother was very supportive. So I didn't feel like that was a thing, but it is a thing for a lot of people and it can be very isolating. And the way that like people treat beautiful people and, and when I say beautiful, I just I, look, I'm doing air quotes, um, whatever that, whatever the society's idea of that is, but people treat them differently. Like, and it doesn't matter if, if out, like your face is cute, if they think you're fat, then that's a thing. Like I remember working at a job once and there was, uh, I was like training like a, some new, a new employee. And she was a really nice woman. She was older and she was full figured. And the guy who sat next to me at the end of the day when she left, you know, my station, he said, "Um, how is she? And I was like, you know, she's nice. And he was like, she has to be. I was like, what do you mean? He was like, because she's fat. Oh, my gosh. And now I was I was fat, too. I just I wasn't as large as her. But I was like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Wow. I was like, no, I'm sorry. Fat people do not have to be fucking nice. No, you don't have to be nice. Like, that's not like a qualifier. Like, oh, if you're fat, you have to. That's some bullshit. I was like, no. Incidentally, I'm happy to report that 20 years later, he's fat. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, you know what, though? That brings up a really interesting point that I've, I've talked to other um, uh, fellow fat people with is that when you're especially when it comes to relationships, I went through a stage where because you're fat, you feel like you have to try harder or you feel like you have to, you know, do other things when it comes to, um, I know a lot of women who, when it comes to being in relationships or even just, you know, having casual sex that you feel like you have to do certain things Yes, because you don't feel good about your body and you're waiting for something to validate that. Um, I know I went through a, a, a small stint in college where, you know, I just felt like, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'm lucky that he wants to go out with me or I'm lucky that, you know, he's taking me doing all these nice things for me. Like I have to have sex with him. And I feel sad, you know, that I was ever at that point. But I also think that it's something that's very relatable. And I and I wasn't really super secure with my body. You know, I was curvy and I and I liked that. But I felt like I owed them something because my body was less than what society deemed as beautiful. I, th- I think that a lot of women do feel like that. Um, definitely. Like I've, I've had those friends, I've had those clients where they are overcompensating and, you know, tolerating behavior, like even sexual behavior that they don't like or, you know, sexual yeah. behavior that's painful that they just will, you know, feel like they have to do. I mean, and I think not women of all kinds go through it, but I do think that the internal, the story that drives the the behavior is the thing that keeps us stuck in it, you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I remember having a, a friend and we were young still, like, you know, we were in middle school. And I, I, at this point, you know, I had, I'd only read about sex. I didn't really know anything. Um, yeah. I had just like read my first adult, like, you know, um, novel that had like real sex in it, like aside of Judy Bloom, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like already like giving head. Wow. And I, you know, like now in hindsight, and she she wasn't heavy, but she had insecurities. Like she had yeah. other insecurities. And I remember like she was very, you know, sexual, 
And I know part of that was that her body came online, but the other part, like the the other part, because the way she was being treated by the people she was giving blowjobs to, yeah. like people that are ignoring you, like they're ignoring you in the fucking hallway. They're acting like they don't know you. Right. Like, I know that that like her her behavior wasn't just about her being aroused. It was about her needing validation and she was yeah. getting it from people that didn't really give a shit about her. Oh, I know. And I hate, I just hate that. And it's still such a, it's a like, thing. I think, yeah. yeah, you're right. For women of, I mean, a lot of women, not just big girls. And it's really sad. I mean, I, and I, and also I think that that's why we need to be talking about sex more. Oh my God. Yes. Having more open conversations. You know, my parents never talked to me about sex ever. And I wish that they would have, I have a girlfriend, two sisters and they're, their father is actually a pastor and they told me the best advice that their dad ever gave them was that, you know, when you do start becoming sexually active, please understand that your satisfaction and happiness is just as important as a man's. I want to kiss him. Like <laughs> I want to kiss him. No, I cannot. <laughs> adult or in your teens. I, I mean, to this day, I think I probably just figured that out, you know, like two years into my current relationship, like, oh, this is what it's supposed to be like. No one has ever, no one ever says, hey, both partners are supposed to be equally satisfied. And if you're not, then you're not with the right partner or you guys need to work on that. Absolutely. It's always been women were here to be, you know, secondary to the man's pleasure. It's on him. He makes the moves. You know, he's the one who's initiating things and you're just kind of there to, you know, be part of it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's how I, that's how I figured when I first, you know, started having sex, that's kind of the idea I had. And like, how off was I and how sad for me that I wasted years having that in my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I def, that was one, I have one daughter, she's um, 22 and I don't know why that was important for me to instill in her, but I wanted her to understand that her pleasure was important. I remember like talking with her friends in high school when they would talk about oral sex. And I was like, girls, let me tell you something. When they're talking about oral sex, they mean you sucking dick. I was like, they're not like me. Like boys are not like muff diving like crazy in high school. Right. So I was like, they're talking about you sucking dick. And so let me tell you, if he's not eating pussy, you don't suck a dick. That, yeah. That's what I told them because I I already knew what it was like. Like by the time, I mean, I, by, I started having sex at 16 and my the guy I slept with, he was my boyfriend. Um, I didn't even really like him. I just need, I felt like I he had to be my boyfriend in order, for, but it, I initiated it. But okay. I, I still I still was under the, con the construct of not wanting to be labeled a slut for it. So yeah. so I I wanted to him to be my boyfriend for that. It wasn't because I liked him. Um, but anyways, um, he never ate pussy, though. I mean, I sucked his dick one time and he never ate pussy. And I think like by the time I'm sure that I had at least like three or four sexual partners before I had a partner that actually ate pussy. Yeah, I did too. I did too. And I remember, I remember it so vividly because it was my first real orgasm. Me too. I thought my, I thought he was going to think I was retarded. My legs wouldn't stop shaking. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> but like, I just think it's so sad that we have to, I don't know, like, why did it take us that long to figure it out? And I just, it's so important. I wish that more parents were open to having conversations with their kids and not having it be like this awkward, uncomfortable thing. Like it's not sexuality. Sex is not awkward. It can be if you never have talked to anybody about mm -hmm. it, but let's not have that be the case. Well, I think that we have to normalize the conversation young. And I think that that is really the only real solution to like the sexual assault problem is I, that I, a lot of it is that like the men that are perpetuating this, some of it's not that they don't know it's wrong. So I'm not at, I'm not condoning their behavior by any stretch of the imagination. But what there is a shame that drives sexual assault. Like if you feel like you have to take something from somebody or force something on somebody, you probably feel shameful about whatever arouses you. But what if someone had told you, you know, when you were younger, OK, you get aroused by, you know, the idea of someone choking. Guess what? There are women that like to be choked. 
Exactly. And exactly. If, you, if you if you if someone told you that all these things are available, you just have to find someone that likes what you like. If someone told you that, you wouldn't feel like you have to force that shit on someone. And even if 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 forcing sex is is something that arouses you, guess what? There are people that like to simulate rape. Simulate rape. That yes. it's consensual and they are willing to do that. Oh, you can find anything, anything, anything that, that is pleasurable to you. It is out there, but you can find it. You don't have to force it. And I, I mean, that's such a valid point. I really didn't think about that until now, but yeah, I, I, I'm with you like normalize. That's why I was really excited to even talk to you because I, even with my page, you know, I have, I, I have people telling me that you need to be careful, you know, brands aren't going to want to work with you. And it's so frustrating to me because I'm like, I've not even tapped into, I've barely tapped into, you know, everything that I want to talk about Mm -hmm. and show and it's already coming up. And I said, that's really sad. And I said, that's not part of my, that's not part of, I have to stay true to my brand. So if companies don't want to work with me because they think I'm too risque or you can see the outline of my nipple, like, okay, you know what? We'll find a different company because this is silly. It's mm-hmm. just ridiculous. Well, and I think like now that they, what do you think about the the federal law that they passed, um, which was supposed to be focused on sex trafficking, but now it's really, there's a huge impact on the sex worker population. Mm-hmm. I think that, I think it just speaks to this shame that we, yeah. that we have been that's undercurrent in society. Everyone wants to act like nobody's fucking except for there's so many people on this planet. Everybody's fucking. Yeah. Everyone. No, I, 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 that's one of my frustrations with, um, I mean, I don't claim to be a feminist. You know, I believe in a lot of things that a feminist would support. I love like, you. I, I feel exactly the same way. Go on. <laughs> one thing that, yeah. The one thing that really frustrates me though, is it's very, um, you know, it's just so hypocritical, hypocritical, excuse me, especially when it comes to sex workers, um, transgender women, you know, you, feminists want to say, oh, we support you. We support feminist uh, rights for women and equality, da, 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 but they don't. And I feel like sex workers are some of the most underrepresented and attacked group you know, in this country, at least. Mm -hmm. And like you said, everyone's having sex. And you know what, you know, several people, I'm sure whether they'll admit it or not, who have paid to have sex or whatever the case may be. So why, why are we not? Why are we not seeing this is a job just like any other job? And imagine how much safer these women and men would be if we could just get behind them and support them a little bit. I agree. I've I've never met a woman who wasn't a sex worker. I've right. ne- I've never met a woman who Thank wasn't you. a sex worker. I'm sorry. Your man is paying for sex. I don't it might not it might look like him taking the trash out. It might look like him buying you that new bins that you want. It might look like him taking you on vacation, but guess what? He is fucking paying for sex. Yep. We oh, are, it's sex is transactional. I mean, sometimes we pay an emotion you know, but but let's be real. Even in relationships, sometimes we play we pay with the almighty dollar. That's the truth. Yep, I totally agree. And and all of those, you know, women who have this idea that, oh, he takes me out to dinner, you know what I mean? He takes me on a nice day. Oh, we're gonna have sex. Yes. You know what I mean? That's the definition of a sex worker. Exactly. Like what are these other women doing? differently than you nothing and people don't want to people don't want to view themselves in that light because they think it's bad there is nothing wrong with that i have i have actually said like i'll in a relationship like i'll fuck you this how much it's gonna cost and we (laughs) laughed about it and he paid i mean and it wasn't it wasn't like a you know it was a joke and but i was serious and he paid and right. it wasn't like, oh my God, that was prostitution. Like, we're in a fucking relationship. You know, it, you were going to give me money anyway. Like, yes. what's the difference? What's the difference? There, there is no difference. It's just this silly uh, idea that we have that, that, again, sex is dirty. And when it's in front of us as a paid transaction that blatantly, then it's really dirty and we should not support it. It's insane. It's just, I, I, it's very frustrating to me, the whole 
everything that happens and does not happen for sex workers. I think it's very shameful of us. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I definitely, um, and I think people don't realize all that, all the, all the different facets of sex work. You know, I think that people might assume it's just prostitution, but right. it isn't. You yeah. know, sex work is sometimes it's cam work. Sometimes, yeah. you know, and then what about the people who are um, disabled, who actually have sex surrogates because they're not able to? I mean, there's yeah. there's so many there's so many different layers. And um, I think, again, people just don't people don't know. I think people are just so um, close close minded to sex in general that everything is an issue. Exactly. And I'm not sure. I mean, I am, I guess I have a pretty good idea how we got there. You know, we live in a pretty conservative country that wants to have control over what people want to do with their bodies, especially women. Let's be real. If it was a, if it was a country of male sex workers, I'm not sure we would even be having this conversation. I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, you know, I, I think that the tide is turning slowly, like tides, it takes time, you know. I think that, you know, the the acceptance that we are all hoping that will happen is not going to happen fully with us, but maybe like the children that are born, you know, just like millennials have a whole different, I mean, cause I'm not a millennial, but it's a whole different energetic, like the, like the stuff that was bothersome to older generations, it started to taper. Like, you know, being gay was still a thing when I was a kid, that was stuff yeah. people got teased about. And I'm not saying, and I'm not in any way saying that, you know, um, being gay is still not a marginalized thing. It is, but I'm, but it's way less in the millennials do not give a fuck about that as much as my generation did. No, definitely. You know what I mean? So, so like the children of millennials are going to have way less you know, they're going to be way less conversations about sex work being bad. They're going to be way less conversations about race. There's going to be way less conversations about, you know, um, genders and all those things. Cause those, those constructs are dissolving right now, but it yeah. takes a couple of generations for that to, you know, I mean, think about, I um, read a book not too long ago, um, Dan Brown's origin book. And in one of the, it, one of the characters says, you know, there was a time when people believed that Poseidon was God right. and, and it took their kids to finally accept that that was a myth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they couldn't wrap their head around it because it's like, what do you mean? Poseidon is real, <laughs> you know, but it took their children to accept that that wasn't true. Yeah, I know. I, and I know we're on the right path. It just seems like a, there's so much that we, I, there's so much growth that you know, we need to do as a society. And sometimes it just feels like it's going so slow and it's very frustrating. It, it, you know, it is, it is, but the, this thing, conversations like these are the reason things are changing yeah. because we cannot change. We can't shift anything. We can't move the needle even a little bit without dialogue. It just cannot happen. So now that they're, and that's why, th that's why as much as I disagree with him, and as much as I can't stand most of the things that come out of his mouth, that's the reason that Trump was the president we needed. Because we needed a dick in office to make us have hard conversations. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if we have to find a silver lining, that would be it. <laughs> that, that's, that's the best I could do. <laughs> That's the best. That's all I got. I don't have anything else good to say. I know. <laughs> I'm yeah. But I really believe that because like anything, the only way that humans make change is when discomfort occurs. Yes, absolutely. We just don't do it. I mean, when things are going great, we are never like, let me make this better. No, this is fine until it isn't fine anymore. And that's the only that's the only way that we start to make shift happen. So. I think that the level of discomfort that we are experiencing is exactly what we need because change just won't happen otherwise. Yes. Yep. You're right about that. We're so. creatures of habit. We like when shit is good. 
We like we and it doesn't and by good, it doesn't even have to be great. It could just be what we know. Like that's why this these paradigms have existed for so long. It's not that everybody agreed or that everybody liked it. It was just that we knew it and we were comfortable with that level of discomfort. Yes. Yep, you're right. Until somebody with a big mouth and bad hair got on the mic and start saying the wrong thing. Oh my god. And now <laughs> now these conversations are happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I'm going to focus on that for the next Lord two years. I, I guess can't, I can't believe we're. I can't believe we are still so early in this presidency. It feels like the longest thing ever. I mean, it it has been because it's every single day is some new ridiculous chaos. Yes, I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I agree. This has been great. I want to ask you two more questions. Okay. Two, one of them is fun. Okay, so I'm going to give you three descriptors and you tell me what you think the item is. Okay. Okay, first descriptor. I'm no big thing unless you're not getting any. Second, okay. I get sucked. Third, I make breasts rise and fall. What am I? Oh my gosh. Oh, no big thing. I get sucked and I make breasts rise and fall. I I have no idea. Air. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I I never I, I never get those right. I would have never guessed that in a million years. <laughs> okay, last question. This is a question I ask um every all my guests. What's your favorite way to be cared for when sex is over? Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Probably <laughs> <laughs> if I'm being honest, just leave me alone and let me take a nap. Yes. <laughs> you can have it any way you like. <laughs> I I mean, it. Yeah. I don't have anything mushy or romantic. You know what I mean? That's just the real answer. You know what? A lot of women say that, actually. I mean, I'm not, to be very honest, like, I'm not a huge um, cuddler. Like we can cuddle like for five minutes or something, but then I just want to, I just want to take a nap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hear you. I think, you know, I sometimes if, if I've had like, uh, if I've had a huge orgasm, I definitely need you to not touch me for a minute. Yes. Like you can't. Like yes. Physically, I can't. Handle yeah. It. Like don't touch me. Don't do anything. Just be over there. I'll tell you when it's safe to come back. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. This has been so great. Thank you so much for doing this work for, for being so willing to be vulnerable because people need proof. You know, we do, we need, we need proof. We need proof that we're not alone. We, We need proof that there are people that look like us. We need proof that we can rise. Yes. There are proof that we need proof that we can recover. We need we need evidence that we, that if you think you're good enough, we need evidence that I I need evidence that I am too. And I know that there's so many women and men too who are inspired by the work that you're doing about the fact that you are using your own like your like you know your body is is your work. Yes, you know, like your body is your work, and your work speaks for itself. And so the fact that you're willing to use the the outfit you came to this planet in to as a as a means to help other people evolve i think that that's fucking awesome thank you so much stacy and and i'm here to be proof that you can look however you look be a big girl and still be having amazing sex and great orgasms look say it again <laughs> because i have great sex like <laughs> Like, I love, I have fucking great sex. Like, and you know what? I honestly feel like, I feel like every man secretly wants to fuck a big girl. I really feel like that's the truth. (laughs) They do. do. But Uh, we're not here to be their fetish either. No, you know what? You're absolutely right. Um, That's a question that I typically, I ask two questions. Have you ever been with a black woman and have you ever been with a big girl? Because I'm not interested in being anyone's fetish. Exactly. You're just trying to try some shit out. You got to, I'm not the one for that. And I've had that happen to me before, and it's not good. At all. At all. I hear you. Well, thank you so much, Stacey. Honestly, this was so refreshing, and I, I'm I'm happy to talk to you anytime. And um, I think what you're doing, the conversations that you're having are so needed. So keep having them and invite me back anytime. 
Thank you for sharing your time with me and for being awesome and for keeping it 100%. That's so important. Like authenticity is so attractive. Nothing, you'll get nothing but that from me. The Sensuality Project is produced, edited, and hosted by me. Music by bensound.com. The Sensuality Project podcast is a production of stacyherrera.com.